uh, Susan Plessick is here as well. And uh, I'm just going to talk very briefly about uh, why we're doing this. And uh, I'll then pass it on to Susan to uh, cover the PSI uh, short form uh, in use. So this, is, uh, this training is part of the second stage shelter project, which we've been now doing for about um, two years. And uh, the purpose of the project has been to bring together all of the second state province to start talking about how we can best gather data to can um, be collectively accountable and also collectively able to advocate on behalf of the women and second state shelters. And one of the key outcomes of that work has been the second state shelter funding that has just come from the uh, human services. So we've um, it's been a great project with really great results. And uh, today uh, we're talking about um, two uh, tools that we are using as part of this project. One is the PSI and the other one is the acuity scale. Uh, again, all part of uh, making sure that we can accurately describe who the women are and what their needs are. And uh, Susan uh, can talk a little about the PSI and uh, uh, its use. Um, and Kat, you were going to tell us, tell us about the webinar and how that was going to go as well? Mm -hmm. Just briefly. Um, so as you guys have probably noticed, your microphones are muted. Um, we have had some feedback around uh, submitting questions in the webinars um, and it being a bit challenging because of the pace of um, the presentation and trying to organize your question and type it out. Um, and so one suggestion we've had from shelters is to have you, the participants, just send us a quick note in the questions window uh, with a cue or just advising us that you have a question and you are putting it together. Um, and then that will notify us that we need to give you a bit of time uh, to organize your question. So we're going to give that a shot today, so please continue to use the questions window to type your questions. Um, feel free to give us the heads up, as I've suggested, and uh, we will take regular breaks throughout the presentation to address any questions that come in. We're also available after the webinar to receive questions over email. Probably with this subject matter, um, Susan and Irene are the people you'll want to contact. I personally don't know much about the PSI or the acuity scale. Um, and this video will also be made available on our members only website for you to access later. So if there is something you've missed or something that you want to revisit, um, or if this training is something that you want to share with other staff members who weren't able to attend today, uh, the video will be available to you there. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Kat. Hi, it, my name is Susan Plessick, and I'll be talking to you about the PSI, Parent Stress Index, the fourth version of this in the short form. And some, I hope that most of you have received a copy of the manual and have been able to look at the actual tool itself, which can be really helpful. I'll explain a little bit more about that after. If you have received the manual, you will see that it is very thick. Um, it's, I don't know how many pages, but many, many pages. But really, all that will pertain to you is starting on page 56. Overwhelmed by the size of the manual, because most of the manual talks about the long form. And what shelter directors have opted to use is the short form. And those of you that have used the Parent Stress Index in the past, in the third edition of it. And it's just recently been updated, but as far as the actual scoring, etc., it, it's not any different than the third edition. Just some of the questions have been reworded a bit. So it's really not a lot different than the third um, edition of the Parent Stress Index. The long version uh, consists of 101 questions and an additional 19 questions that look at life. So the 35 uh, on the short form come directly from the long form. So the short form offers a quick assessment of the issues that impact parents that might be causing them stress in their role as parents. 
the the pages that really to take a look at in your manual are pages 57 to 62. So they really those pages will give you a real good overview of the short form. So if you're wondering what are the benefits of doing in this um, parent stress index with the women that you're working with, the index will provide both you and the mom with information that may help identify areas of stress. And those of you are, that are parents know that parenting is stressful. And for these moms that you'll can stay that much more complex in dealing with their parenting issues. So it's really to help you and the mom identify those areas that you might identify and work on while she's in second stage with you. It provides a roadmap, it provides some direction for your work with the women. We know that stress by a mom during those first three years are very critical to that child's development, to their emotional and behavioral development as well as that attachment between the mom and the child. It's a really important piece of work that can take place while moms are in second stage shelter. The short form takes about 10 minutes to complete, so it's a form that you do give to the mom to complete. There are, as I said, 36 questions on that form, and they're written at about a grade 5 level. So as long as someone has some basic literacy skills, they should be okay to complete it themselves. If the mom is language, English is her second language, or her literacy level is very low, it's certainly okay to read the questions to her. The questions have been designed for parents of children that are ages 12 and under, so that's important to remember. When mom is completing, she is to complete the form keeping in mind just one child. So if she has two or more children and she's finding that it's stressful to parent two or more children, then it would be um, best to give her um, three different or two or three different forms to complete so that she's focusing on each individual child as she's answering the questions. So each mom is given the booklet and a pen or a pencil to complete the questions. And it's important that she understand that if she changes any of her responses that they need to be crossed out with an X and then the correct answer circled. And it's important that the mom completes each question or else the scale is not valid. Okay, this is a screenshot of the second page of the form. The front page of the form, for those of you that have had a chance to look at it, um, provide the instructions to the mom on how to answer the questions. So this is page two. Page three is much the same with the additional questions making up the 36 questions. Ask to read the statements and then circle once that best fits her experience. So the first question is, I often have the feeling that I cannot handle. She could choose strongly agree, agree, not sure, agree, or strong, strongly disagree. And she goes through and answers each of those questions. And if you notice on question 22, um, it's a different kind of response. I feel that I am choose this response from the choices below. So one is a, a very good parent, two, a better than average parent, three, an average parent, and so on. So where she's supposed to circle her response is on the, the right-hand column. That's important to help you with your scoring. So once mom has completed PSI 4, then you can take some time to score it. So you might um, ask her to wait while you score it and then meet with her again to explain the scoring to her, which is really important. So this is a carbon 
um, tool, so it can be So I'm, I'm sure that each one of you received a number of these scales. So what you do is you tear off the strip on the side of the form and you remove the top sheet. Underneath, you will see where the woman has circled her responses and then you are, from there you're able to add up the different responses. It says if there are more than one response, results are If she's missed one, it is possible to um, calculations to figure out an average score. And rather than go through those in detail right now, those instructions are on page 59 of your manual. Okay, so we're going to look at how do you score the PSI, and, and certainly this will make much more sense if you're able to look at one right now. Um, that might be helpful for you. But once you take off the top sheet and then you look where the responses have been written on the carbonated paper, you are directed to add up those responses in the shaded area. And those ones are numbers. Questions 1, 2, 3, 8, 9, and 11. And you add those up and you put that total score in the box that's labeled defensive responding. Going through what each of these subscores mean in a bit. You then go back and you add up all the responses to the questions 1 to 12 and total those in the box labeled parental distress the responses 13 to 24 and put that total in the box labeled parent-child dysfunctional interaction and then the responses 25 through 36 and total that and put that in the box labeled difficult child. To get the overall altar you add up uh, sums from the parental distress functional interaction, and the difficult child boxes. You do not add the responding total to get the total stress. This is what the first page of the scoring sheet looks like. And so you will notice that the first box there at the top says defensive responding. So I've added up the numbers in the shaded areas. It's shaded a light green, and it's This box is looking at parental distress, and that is 22. And then parent-child dysfunctional interaction is that box down there at the bottom. Okay. There aren't any questions as yet, I don't think. No questions yet. Thanks, Kat. So those boxes, what you're putting in are the raw scores. And what those raw scores will be converted into percent. You won't need to do that calculation. That is calculated for you on page three of that form. So when we're looking at what do these scores mean, we'll be looking at the percentiles. So it's just important to know that. Okay, so this is the form where you'll see the percentiles. hard to see on the screen, but if you look on the far left, and the raw score was 22 for parental distress. And then as you go up that column and find 20, and then look to the right, you'll see the percentile, which is 36. So you do that for each of those subscores to find the percentile. And then you do the same for the overall raw score, which was 87. And then you just go up that column for the total stress score, over to the right, 
and find the percentile. So understanding what do these scores mean, in your manual it explains it fairly well what the different scores mean, but normal ranges for scores are within the 16th to 84th percentile, so it's quite a broad range for a normal score. Scores from 85th to 89th percentile are considered high, and then scores 90 percentile or higher are considered clinically significant. Okay, so just checking, Kat, any questions or comments yet? We don't have any at this time, nope. Okay, so should we wait a minute or? Sure, we can wait a moment if you'd like. Okay. Somebody said something. Is there something, Kat? Uh, nope. No? Okay, well, we'll move along then. Okay. Okay, so we'll look first at what does uh, defensive responding mean. This is the extent to which a parent, mom or dad, is trying to answer the questions in a way that she thinks will make her look good. So she's reading the questions and trying to think, well, what's the best response to make me look like I'm an effective parent? Ten, a score of 10 or less indicates a parent may be responding in a defensive manner. So that's a low score. But we need to be cautious in interpreting any of the subscales or even the total stress scores. A low score may mean that the parent is trying to portray herself as confident and free of stress. It may mean the parent is not invested in the role of being a parent, or it may mean the parent is very confident. So we need to be really careful in how we interpret that, that, scale, that score. It's important to look at all the subscores as well as the overall stress score to get an idea of what might be going on for any particular So as I said, it's, it's, the score itself does not in three hypotheses is likely true. It needs to be examined in relation all other information that you have about the mom. Parental distress is the degree to which a parent is experiencing stress in their role as a parent. So it's not looking at other stressors in her life, her work stress, etc but anything related to her role as a parent. So it's looking at parenting competency, stressors associated with restrictions on her life, conflict possibly with the child's other parent, her lack of or social support or depression she might be experiencing. Scores at or above the 90th percentile in combination with a difficult child score below the 70, well, the parent might benefit from activities aimed at her own sense of self or her sense of parental competency. So a parenting class might be useful for her so that she feels more confident in her role as a parent. The parent-child dysfunctional interaction subscore is the extent to which the parent believes her child does not meet her expectations and that their interactions are not satisfying to her. High scores may indicate that the parent sees the child as a disappointment, feels rejected or alienated from the child, that the child has not bonded with, or the mom has not bonded with her child. So again, it's important to also look at the score, but also observe what to, the interaction between mom and child. There may be a lack of warmth shown between mom and child. 
And really high scores may suggest the potential for child abuse. So it's just something to pay attention to and, and be very observant about the interactions between mom and child. So once again, it's, it's important to be cautious. So if mom scores really high in the parent-child dysfunctional interaction, um, look at the total stress scores, look at the other subscale scores to get a better indication of what's going on. If all three are high, 91% or higher, there is the greater likelihood of child abuse. If the parent distress subscore is low, 75% or low, parental loss of control is not likely. It's likely that mom is coping not too badly and there are difficulties in their interaction, but um, the likelihood of child abuse are lower. So likely then mom is coping reasonably well with the behavior of the child. Okay. Over the age of two and scores at or above the 90th percentile may indicate a parent is having a difficult time gaining the child's cooperation. So it's useful to, with ideas of activities that might be appropriate for her to do with the child at that age. It's important that mom learns about playing with her children. And we know that often moms that have lived with violence in a relationship spend so much of their energy just surviving so that that relationship or time playing with may not have happened very often. So it's important to model that and encourage that. So to provide opportunities for them to play together in, the, in your child's support and to model that for, for them. Filial therapy may be useful as well. is that of the difficult child and this is how easy or difficult the parent perceives her child to be. In this scale, this portion of this on some of the basic behavioral characteristics of children that make them more difficult or easy to manage. And some of this is temperament and those of us that are parents know that children come with different temperaments and some are more easy to parent than others. And then sometimes children learn behaviors. And some of the children that you will see in your shelters may have learned some behaviors from um, their fathers that may have been abusive and um, which contributes to the difficulties in managing their behavior. Children 18 months or younger with scores at or above the 90 percentile indicate a child is having problems with self-regulation. And it, sometimes it is helpful to make a referral to a pediatrician on the behalf of a mom, if that's something that she's interested in. Parents may also benefit appropriate discipline. So we know it's very different to discipline an 18-month-old versus a year old And so that's why parenting class can be really useful. In extreme cases, where is 96%, it may need, mean that the child would benefit from seeing a child psychologist or engaging in play therapy. If a difficult child subscore is in the 90% or higher and the other subscores are lower, short-term parent education may be helpful. Okay, and then the total uh, stress score, it looks at the extent of the stress the parent is feeling in her role. And as I said previously, it does not take into account stressors associated with other life. When the overall score, so that's adding up all the subscores, is at or above the 90th percentile, if it from more in 
support and maybe a referral to a therapist. If when you're using the parent stress index and you have mom complete it, it's really important when you meet with her to ask her to complete this, that you explain why you're asking her to do this. And as I said at the beginning, it's, it's important to normalize parental stress. So we don't want moms to feel criticizing them or judging their parenting. About helping them in areas where you might want to put to help her during the time that she's living with you. Tool, coaching tool. It's really about helping her in her role as a parent. It's important to be sensitive, kind, use strength-based words to really focus in on what you see that she. And it's important to have dialogue with the parent. So completing the scale, but it's asking her how is it. In, in your role as a parent. What do you find difficult? What do you find enjoyable? Can we help you during your time here at this shelter with us? Not just to identify scores, but we need to be able to then identify that she can work on these things. So it's not just enough to know that she's in a particular area. So what can we do to work with you to stress? That's an important thing. So the scores really provide a guide for interventions. And that's one of the reasons why it was chosen as a tool for the second stage program. The advantage of doing the parent stress index in second stage is that it can be given to mom near the beginning of her stay at second stage. And then she has and you have six months to a year, some shelters that can stay for a year, to work on those areas. And then before she's in stage, it would be important to give her that scale again. And then to review those scales with mom. This meeting, it would review both her scores from the pre and the post. She could see the areas where she has grown in and hopefully see where the stress in her role as a parent have decreased. It's really important to focus on those changes that she has parent and really focus on them as that she has done the work to make those changes. And then as she's leaving second stage, it would be important to talk about if there's areas that she wants to continue to work on as a parent, how she might do that. Whether that's through outreach or some community-based programs. And we'll stop once again and see if there's any questions or comments. So we haven't received any questions um, related to the content, but uh, one participant did point out that um, it would be helpful to have the PowerPoint, a copy of the PowerPoint. And so I just wanted to point out to everyone that we have made handouts available on this webinar. So just below um, the questions window, you'll see that there is a handouts window and there are four out of five um, documents there. So we have copies of all of the acuity scale related uh, materials um, that Irene's provided. And we also have a copy of this PowerPoint that you're welcome to download uh, to your computer and save uh, to review later. Okay, thanks, Kat. No problem. Okay, and now we get on to everyone's favorite outcome tracker. So it's, it's for the second stage project that, that you do enter the subscores into outcome tracker. And so probably for most of you this is quite familiar, but someone's file, so we're in Betty Smith's file, and she's just completed the parent stress index, and I want to enter the tracker. I go into her file, I'm going to click on activity list, and then I'm going to click an activity. So what you're seeing on the screen right now is a list of activities that a particular client, Make Believe client in the ACWS site has completed. So then we're going to 
click on Enroll in Activity. Okay. And then you'll choose, you'll be taken to a list of all the activities that are in your shelter's outcome tracker site. And then you click on PSI, and then you will be taken to a screen that looks like the one you're seeing right now. And what I want to point out is the box. So if you click down arrow, you will have the option to choose pre or post. It's the first time or the mom has completed the PSI, we pick pre and put in the date that she has completed the PSI. Choose your name. The hours are not important. Uh, you put in the total overall defensive responding score, the subscore for parental distress, subscore for parent-child dysfunctional interaction, and the subscore for difficult child. And then you add up the scores for parental dis parent child dysfunctional interaction difficult child to get the overall stress score important thing that's um, that's going to be different that from now on is that maybe I'll get you to do the next slide honey okay so an important change starting immediately so those of you that have previously used the PSI, you were instructed to enter into Outcome Tracker the raw scores. Starting immediately, um, we're asking you to enter the percentiles in the appropriate subscore. So we'll just go back. Yeah. Okay. So now instead of bus scores, we're asking you to put in the percentile. So remember back to the page where um, on the form, yeah, we'll go back to that. And okay, it's coming. And on the form, right on the form, you're so the bottom scores there, 36, 58, and I may have made a mistake, I think, but anyway, the 36, 58, and 68 are the percentiles. So those are the scores that you will now enter into Outcome Tracker instead of the raw scores. Okay. And, and I wasn't aware of informing that she was doing that, so if everyone was putting in the raw scores, she was converting them into the percentiles. So if you can just start putting in the percentiles yourselves, that will save Irene some work. Right, Irene? <laughs> it just makes it that much easier. It's also more meaningful. It's also more meaningful to you. That's right. Okay. Okay. So any questions, comments? None at this time. Okay. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to... Okay, um, <clears throat> so before before I start talking, Kat, I just wanted to again with the group um, about the questions, and I really want to give people an opportunity to answer any questions that they might have. So, as what we heard last time we did this is that um, the uh, webinar moved on too quickly for people to write things down. So. Um, to make sure that if people have a question that they can a quick way to let us know that there's a question and how do they do that again Kat? So um, under the questions window if they need some time to prepare their question but want to just let us know that they have one um, they can type in a quick message or just type in a queue and then we will know um, we can pause things for them and give them a chance to get their question organized. Okay, so just a letter Q that they can type in and, uh, yeah. and then we can wait. Yeah, okay. So I'm just going to give people uh, maybe a couple of moments in case that's the case, and then we'll, we'll move on. Sounds great. Okay. 
So I'm going to talk about the acuity scale. Um, how this is different from the uh, PSI, we really at this point do not have a scale uh, in outcome or anything that we can uh, as a, a completable tool process of developing it. And what we've uh, asked uh, you to do and your executive directors to do is help us in the process of developing the scale. So I will talk to you about what it is, how eventually we're hoping to use it, what the process of testing is all about, um, and uh, how you can help us. So the, what is the acuity scale? Acuity really just means complexity. We're trying to come up with is a way to speak to complexity of women's needs that are in the shelters in one number. So you know you know that women come in with a it could be physical health, mental health, safety obviously, some of the might be experiencing. So a variety of different things and some women have more of those issues than others. And there isn't really a way right now that we can say here's the number that represents how complex her, all those issues are. Um, so there are scales like that out there. Uh, some of you probably know about SPIDAT or FSPIDAT that speaks to, that's in the homelessness world, speaks to the idea of complexity. What we're trying to do here is something a little bit different that is specifically related to women in domestic violence shelters. And it's developed to, a, to a take a gender-based perspective and intimate partner violence perspective. So here we're starting to look at issues such as safety, trauma from the perspective of domestic violence and how a domestic violence causes trauma rather than just uh, other types of mental health issues that chronically homeless We look at their involvement with a legal system, uh, the impact of children, and it's focused on women rather than family. So <clears throat> The other important piece to mention is that what we're trying not to create an additional scale that you or women have to complete. What the idea will be is as you do intake and you gather information through intake, you will enter uh, information into a come tracker. And then what we will do is pull the pieces, specific pieces relevant to the acuity calculation out of outcome tracker through automated formulas and to see the number uh, related to complexity without having to complete any kind of separate scale. So that's the overall idea of the scale. So I'll just stop briefly here if we have any um, questions from people. Again, just type in a quick queue if you do. Okay. So what is the purpose of the acuity scale? It allows you to, well, I think one of the most important purposes here is so that we can speak to the resources, the shelter, to address the needs of the women in their shelters. So if you're finding that in your shelter or, or in your caseload, there are really high complex, then it means that you need additional shelter um, to address or you need to be able to know what kind of um, resources that are in your community that you need to link her with, or you need to speak to the types of resources that are absent in order to address the needs of the women in your shelter. The acuity scale, acuity number will also allow us to understand how complexity is changing. And as you know, probably women in your shelters change every time and so we can track that change in terms of their complexity to understand what is happening with the population that you're serving. We can also develop and test promising practices. So what we can do is look at what works and what doesn't work for women with different complexity scores. So uh, is a particular intervention more or less um, uh, impactful in terms of the outcomes that they need? What, how does it interact with the demographics of various women? So we can start saying, uh, we can actually start developing new practices and we can become uh, a center of excellence to define what actually is working 
for what types of women that come to the shelters. Acuity scale can support caseload management decisions. So if someone uh, has, let's say, a caseload of uh, you know, 10, 15 women, and you find that the complexity rating of your caseload is really, really high, then that might mean that you need to reduce the number of women on your caseload and maybe they else maybe with lower complexity might be able to manage more women with lower complexity. It allows you to support service referrals decisions, as I had said. As you know uh, the degree of complexity women to experience, then you can start talking about what types of services they might need either within or outside the shelter. We can speak to differences, regional differences. Uh, among shelters uh, across the province. So it would be, maybe we can look at our shelters in, uh, uh, in the north experiencing different types of complexity than the shelters in the south or center. Are we seeing maybe uh, different types of shelters experiencing different types of complexity of needs? So for instance, rural shelters or urban shelters or on reserve shelters or shelters in remote locations. Um, so all of that can say to us more about the complexity across the province and how that can be distributed. So the acuity scale can be used then in different ways to support your caseload decisions, your shelter work, um, your uh, regional work, and also the work across the province. So I'll stop here for questions. Okay, moving on. Um, so how did we develop the scale so far? I'll tell you what we've done to date um, and then talk a little bit about what our next steps are. So uh, Kathy Cairns and myself, and Kathy Cairns is working with me to, ha uh, to develop the scale, have done a literature review to identify various research and practice variables that are specific to women in the second stage shelter and their experiences. Then we had uh, listed all those um, and have had a consultation with your shelter directors. Actually, we've had several consultations over the course of the last um, about six months with respect to what type we consider complexity. Um, we talked with them the types of questions to ask as well as the types of categories to identify to, so that we can have um, a division between the lower, mid, and high scores. We then looked at what we had come up with to determine do we have these items already in Outcome Tracker. And those items were in Outcome Tracker. There were some that the directors, shelter directors had added that is not an outcome tracker, it's important for us to include. So we now have a scale, and I will show it to you in a second. Uh, we now have a scale that we are testing the initial version of the scale. The next with it is to do um, what is called the reliability testing. An example of that is if Susan and I were to complete the same scale uh, looking at an individual woman, would we come up with the same result? Another example of that is if Susan and I complete the scale today, the same scale with the same uh, woman in a month, would we get the same result? Things do not change over time. Part of the testing is going to be a state where we would look at all of the entries that people will have given us over the and we go together as part of like a grouping, what items might be duplicated, what items might not be worded well enough, um, and that will allow us to then come up with final version of the scale. Questions? Okay. So I'm going to show you, but this is uh, what the current version that still needs to be tested has. There are 33 items. There are eight subscales, uh, which includes safety, 
poverty, supports, housing stability, mental health, children, and legal issues. Each item is rated uh, on level of 0, 3, and 5, and you will have specific definitions provided for each item. So in this, you will see one of them is the actual acuity scale. I'm just going to open it for you to, to see. So you, you can see the, um, this is the first page of the scale. And let's look at, for instance, the safety uh, area. So under the safety, we've identified four different tools, if you wish, or questions that uh, address that issue. So the first one is the danger assessment or walking the path together danger assessment. And you can see that the score of zero has um, a danger assessment score of seven or less, which is the variable score in the danger assessment. Our score of three is the increase for the level from eight to 13. And the score of five or extreme danger score of 14 or more. So what you would do is you would, um, as, you have, as you complete the danger assessment, as you already do, you would just simply enter the particular uh, response from the danger assessment, and you would en enter either 0, 3, or 5 into this uh, identify the, the So you would do the same thing with the DVS. Uh, domestic violence survivor assessment uh, includes both the, um, uh, the the different types of readiness levels that the women experience, uh, frequency of current abuse, which is part of the uh, calendar, danger assessment calendar, and the level of conflict is the item that we do not have right now in outcome tracker, and you would just uh, assess that on your own. So um, just to go through this very briefly, I'm not going to read to you all of the other because you'll be able to on your own, but here's the poverty section. And you can see, again, we provide you with specific definitions of what 0, 3, or 5 means. Here's the supports in place or systems involvement. It just talks about personal supports engaged or any kind of systems that are the person is in. A housing stability speaks what their housing has been like prior to their uh, admission into the shelter. Maternal mental health and traumas, their own experience of abuse as children, number of abusive relationships in adulthood, um, impact of events, scale, score, uh, any kind of concerns, suicide risk, addiction, maternal physical health. Here we're looking for physical health, injury and pregnancy, children, information about children and uh, their uh, issues, any issues they might have, and then legal issues that she's experienced. Be able to recognize most of these because they are already in outcome tracker. So it shouldn't be that complicated um, to complete them because you've been doing that already. For the items that are not in outcome tracker, we will, um, I will tell you a little bit more about that later, but we, in, in the course of the testing process, will come up with a way for you to record those. But once the testing process is complete, you're not actually going to see this scale. The scale is here the testing process. The actual information eventually after the test will be in outcome tracker. And so you will just be completing outcome tracker as you usually do the tick. So maybe any questions at this point?
So Irene, there is, I think we have a note that there is a question coming in. Uh, so if we can just wait a moment. Okay. Okay, so the question is, if uh, the woman says she has 10 incidents of abuse per month, is the answer zero for 10 times or high because that would be 120 times per year? Yes, it would be high. Great, thank you. And thank you for your okay. question. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right, um, I'll move on. Okay. So then, so we've talked about the content of the scale and the next uh, part of this uh, conversation is about how we've uh, asked the shelter directors and how we will ask you to support the uh, scale development. What we have done with your uh, is we have given them two different case studies. That it really is just a couple of pages of description of the woman's situation. We had asked them to take the acuity scale form that I had just shown you and had completed on the basis of the information study. We did the, it's, uh, this is a lot easier to do than uh, organizing a different actual way of testing on real people in your shelters. Um, so what uh, the next step for us is um, the shelter staff to now participate in the same process. This is really important because then we are able to hear your opinions about the scale. We are see how well it works before we start implementing it. And we also can understand what kind of changes need to take place uh, so that it reflects um, the shelter directors but also the shelter staff opinions. So what uh, your directors have said to us that they will do is they will organize a staff meeting for scale testing. They will bring you the same two cases completed as well as the acuity scales that I had just showed you. They will also distribute the item definitions. Now that is another attachment that we've added to the list of handouts um, today. So you can familiarize yourself with those. And the, what definitions do is they give a little bit more information about each item where necessary. Um, so if you are not understanding what it means or what the distinctions are, you can definitions and read through uh, to see what it, uh, what it means. Eventually, when the scale is complete and when the definitions are finalized, uh, we will then also use them and add them to the manual so that when you start doing this uh, completion in outcome tracker, you will know exactly what we're talking about so that there's a consistent understanding of different items. And of course, as always, there's going to be training provided to make, uh, like what we're doing right now, but to make sure that we have everyone on the same page for accuracy and consistency. You, you see we're saying here we will repeat the process in three months. What that means is, again, remember I talked about reliability earlier, and that's so that we can the, that your scores do not change over a period of time when you look at the same case study. So it is a reliable scale. It works reliably each time you use it. The main purpose here will be in this, in this case study scoring will be to determine whether or not the scale works. So this is not at all a 
anybody's assessment abilities. It's really purely about is this working, is it clear, can it accurately complete it based on the information you have, and if it's not, then we need to thing or change something based on your feedback. You can see I said down there your feedback is important and really this is this will be half as valuable as what it will be. So when you when you are actually doing the scoring of the case studies with your executive director, what we've um, asked them to do is allow for some time after you've done the scoring, there is a conversation that takes place about your experience, what you what wasn't clear, what worked, what didn't work, what you wish was different. So it's essential that we get that conversation going so that we can hear what you think about um, the items and how they The other um, piece of information that I'd like to just mention about the, um, the scoring of the case study project is, um, is that this is a group um, exercise. So because what we're trying to do is make sure that each individual these scales in their own individual way and that how I complete it and how are is so if I and I'm having conversation about how we're doing it then we're not getting at all at those differences so when you complete it's really you do it alone without um, conversation with your colleague And then what will happen is the case studies uh, that you complete will be scanned and sent to us. And then I will enter them and analyze them and we'll uh, get back um, to the directors and you guys with the, uh, the results of the analysis and what kinds of changes we're proposing based on the analysis. So again, wait here for questions. So we do have a question about um, what the process will be for shelters who don't have some of these questions uh, that, aren't, that aren't, current, er, sorry, aren't currently collecting these questions on their forms. Right. Um, yeah, so excellent question. So a very good example of that is, uh, for instance, a DBSA that people aren't doing, which is the Misfonser Survivor Assessment, or uh, Impact that people also aren't doing. So for those particular items, we will give you in the case study the answers to, so you will not need anything obviously. When we are looking for implementation, that will have to be a conversation uh, among shelter directors as to whether this is something that we're going to be adding to the roster of your questions or whether or not we would take that out of the scale um, to make we do not have too many missing items that to make it invalid. What we wanted to do through this course of testing is to understand how important those particular items are to the overall scale score. And that will come out in the statistical analysis. So once we are armed with that information, then we can come back for further discussion to understand what would the next steps be. And it's quite possible that we may decide to proceed without those particular two scales or questions um, to make sure that we have a uh, scale that works in every shelter. Any cat that you see? Uh, no, that's it so far. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, so what happens after the testing is complete? So once we've had the two case study that you will do shortly and then there'll be another once, then what we will do, as I said earlier, uh, we will do statistical analysis to clarify what items work, what items don't work, what combination of items work to determine um, what items go together, etc. Once that's finished and once we have the conversations about 
the final version of the scale, which will happen with the shelter directors. And we have the final complete uh, 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 questionnaire. So then what we are going to do is we're going to take that scale and we're going to make sure that Outcome Tracker has all of the items that are in that scale available to you to complete. So then, there, then we're getting to a total automation, so there won't be this additional uh, questionnaire you need to fill out, which you're only filling out for the testing purposes. Everything will be an Outcome Tracker, and we will also identify an Outcome Tracker what items go with the scale so people will know what needs to be completed. Then what we'll do is we'll work um, with uh, developers or we'll to develop scoring that means we will identify uh, items that a particular query will need to pull from Outcome Tracker to include in the calculation and then when, eventually where we're going to get it to will be just the button in Outcome Tracker where you can push and say what is the complexity of the women in my shelter for a particular time period. So that's ultimately where we're going. And of course then the not just going to get one score but you're also going to get very high, high, in moderate or low. Um, you're also going to get the uh, subscales possibly like on safety, what is the score, what is the score on mental health or physical health, etc. And some uh, indications of So that's, um, that's kind of the summary of where we're going with the acuity testing and that uh, completes um, my presentation anyway. So if people have any further questions, Susan and I both can answer about the acuity test, the scale, PSI, or any other questions you guys might have. Okay. Kat, okay, I'm assuming we don't have any? Uh, none yet, but I think I'll take this opportunity while we're giving people a few moments to write out their questions just to let everybody know that um, at the end of this webinar, uh, we will have an evaluation pop up uh, when you close the webinar, and we'd really appreciate it if you'd take a few moments to uh, give us some feedback on, um, in particular, the new approach to um, asking questions and any other input you have on um, our webinar format so that we can improve it for you. So, yeah. And of course, the content, which was great. Okay, that sounds like there's no more questions. I think so. I think we're all we're all done for the day. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks for participating. And uh, you know, we're we're certainly open to further questions. I mean, Susan and I both are available to for questions by email or any other way. They come up. Please let us know. Okay. Kat, will you be closing the uh, presentation? Yes, I will do that now. So thanks again, everyone, okay. and have a great day. Thank you.